Well, I just thought I'd have a conversation about the Companion Animals Task Force paper. There's a lot of people and they actually don't really understand what the Task Force paper is actually about. In my opinion, we need a breeder's licensing system. We need a breeder's licensing system for the simple reason that there is no regulation. Now when it comes down to canine councils saying that they regulate their members, they actually don't regulate their members as such. They have a code of ethics which members are meant to abide by, but there is no one actually going out there and checking on these members and making sure that they're doing the right thing by the code of ethics. If in fact there was some kind of an inspector within a canine control doing inspections and making sure that members were doing the right thing, well then yeah, they would be regulated by themselves. Well, honestly, let's talk about the licence. The licence states in the paper that's put together by the task force that it is going to regulate breeders. Now they want to stop breeders with large scale operations, which means more than five litres a year. I mean, it, it probably means more than one litter a month. Who knows? It's not actually explained in detail, which that is one of the problems. If the task force could pull apart its sections and stay in there, we're going to license all breeders, but breeders that are breeding more than five litres a year or five litres a month, um, we're going to then control those people. That would make it a whole lot more understandable for the regular hobby breeder. The regular hobby breeder, which has probably five litres a year, possibly less, possibly more, depending upon which bitches are coming in and what their plans are for the next two or three years. Most hobby breeders actually plan years in advance of what they're planning to do. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way, but the majority of the time it does. So if the task force could break down that licensing scheme and actually have in place an actual figure that is going to actually explain what particular people it's going to affect more than others. Now, they note a commercial breeding establishment. Some people are confused, they think commercial means someone that sells something. Okay, the legal dictionary term of commercial is a business as such. Most hobby breeders aren't a business, but some councils may say because you sell one puppy, you are commercial. That kind of needs a lot of refining. The commercial breeding establishment, the way I take it, is someone who is consistently and continuously breeding litter after litter after litter. Five, six, seven litters every month. There isn't weeks that go by that they don't have litters. Now people say there are no puppy farmers amongst registered breeders. Well, there aren't filthy dirty puppy farmers amongst registered breeders, um, which are the ones that you see through the Oscars law and all those kinds of TV programs and organisations, but there are still puppy farmers. There are people that have gone out just to get a registered breeder's prefix from the Canine Council, just so that they can sell their puppies for more and actually claim that they are a registered breeder. Hence, they get a cheaper, a cheaper council lifetime rego. Um, they pass their, themselves off in advertisements and such as being professional-like, even though they, they aren't. They probably couldn't even recite a breed standard. Dogs New South Wales members are fighting against this licensing system for the fact that they don't understand any in-depth parts of it. So it needs to actually be broken down into a more easier to understand language for the layman. So I don't, um, I don't disprove a 
disapprove of the licence, I actually think it'll be a great idea. Um, I do think it actually needs to be worded a lot better than it is. My main concerns with the whole task force paper aren't in fact the breeders licensing system. It's actually the addition of the potential dangerous dog clause. Now this dog clause, potential dangerous dog, I mean that can open up such a bigger can of worms than we could possibly imagine. We already have BSL in our country, we already have the dangerous dog legislations. Now they want to add a potential dangerous dog clause? Okay, they write and they say that's for dogs that aren't, haven't as such mauled somebody or some other animal um, and caused actual harm, but on page 10, uh, page 11 of the dangerous dog report, it has actually stated in there that this potential dangerous dog clause is going to be decided upon biting breeds. Now biting breeds, all breeds bite, chihuahuas bite, poodles bite, labradors bite, they all bite. Every dog has a potential to bite. Biting breeds? I mean, and they turn around and they said, how are they going to find these biting breeds? Through DNA. DNA can't even find half of the illnesses associated with many of these breeds. So how are they going to define a biting breed through DNA? I find that that one portion of the paper is far more important than the licensing system that they're wanting to bring in. But the simple fact that we have so much BSL now so many breeds are currently affected and now this will open up a can of worms and make it huge, absolutely huge. There's the potential for that section to actually put all of the working breeds, all of the gun dog breeds, the little cocker spaniel out there. It's a biting breed. It goes out, it bites the game to retrieve it. That's what its purpose is. The Australian cattle dog, it's a healer. It's a biting breed. The American Staffordshire Terrier, its history well behind it, which it isn't, hasn't been addressed for these days and, and isn't used for dog fighting, but that is still a biting breed. These breeds that were used for a purpose in their beginnings are biting breeds. The Dobermen, the Mastiffs, the, the non-sporting dogs. You know, what's going to happen to all these breeds if in fact the government brings in a potential dangerous dog clause? I hope everyone can look at that one section and go, no, we don't need a potential dangerous dog clause. If we have a potential dangerous dog clause, what is going to be the effect on breeds down the track? Yeah, a licence. Okay, a licence is going to regulate a lot of breeders. It's not, the, it's not the answer. No, it isn't the answer. Education is the answer. Educating the public, educating the children from preschool upwards, that is the answer. Full on education, everywhere, in people's spaces, all the time. Educate people about the breeds, what your breed requires. If I had my way, every pet owner should be licensed because everyone needs to know what their responsibilities are when they take an animal on. So the licence, although it can be, and the way some people are perceiving it, to be stressful at the moment because it hasn't been clear enough, I suppose, clear enough in their eyes and documented in it exactly what it's going to entail. So that section needs to be looked at do need a licence, it's not going to be the, the whole control measure and it isn't going to stop some underhanded people from still pumping their pups out of their backyard and selling them underhandedly, but I mean that happens. We've got a licence to drive a car but there's still people that break the law. But the laws are there for a reason, to try and prevent bad things from happening. So if the licence system is brought into play, it can and may be a form of control. When microchipping was first brought out, the whole concept of it was absolutely brilliant. A lot of people were scared about it. Some, some microchips still, still are expelled by some breeds, but dogs being microchipped, their owners can be found. It's got a great, great 
side of it and it is a good tool but there needs to be something whereby the microchip the licensing system well hey you know all these microchipped animals are coming out of that property there yep we're going to look at that because it's connected to that license and that license then shows how many puppies that person is pumping out in that year that person if it has 500 puppies pumped out that person needs to be looked at and controlled so the person that is licensed and, and has two litters and maybe 18 puppies in a year compared to the 500, I mean, I think I know where the focus is going to be shifted. And this is why the license is a good idea. It isn't a perfect idea, it isn't perfectly written, but it is a good idea. So try and understand the concept behind the license. Write in your submissions, write what you would like to see change within the license system and look at that dangerous dog report, look at what that potential dangerous dog clause could possibly be and um, do to the majority of dog breeds that bite. And there are a lot. They don't actually bite bite as such, but they are biting breeds. Every dog has that potential to bite. So anyway, people, I just thought I'd waffle a little bit on, on my view. Sometimes when things get typed, they often get taken in, in the wrong context. But overall, BSL is still here. We've been fighting it for 20 years. We're going to be fighting it for a, a long time to come. And if a lot of politicians and a lot of people that don't understand dogs and don't understand breeds and say, that dog bit a person, let's stop that breed. It isn't the solution. The solution is the education, but we don't need more BSL and we don't need a potential danger.